Yeah. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. Today, uh, Alicia is going to be giving her presentation. Uh, she got a BS in chemistry from Beloit College and a master's from UC Irvine. Her research interests are atmospheric chemistry, modeling, and the collection of air samples from landfills, <laughs> which are super interesting. <laughs> Um, she also enjoys knitting and hiking, but has been doing more hike, doing more knitting lately than hiking, because she has a really lazy dog. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, please, uh, please uh, give her a round of a hand for Alicia. Thanks, Terry. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking about my work implementing a new parameterization in the uh, community multi-scale air quality model in the hopes of improving the model's ability to predict and show biochemistry. Um, so this research is funded by the EPA um, and uh, Tim Bershom uh, from the chemistry department and my advisor Tracy Holloway are the co-PIs of the project. So without them, I would be nowhere. Um, I'd also like to thank Monica Harkey. She's a research scientist in the Holloway group, and she is like a modeling extraordinaire. I just, without her, I would not have the last three slides of my presentation to show because there wouldn't be results. Um, so, yeah. So, what is N205? Why do we care about it? Um, N205, dinitrogen hypoxide. Um, is a gas of anthropogenic origin. It comes from reactions of compounds that come from burning fossil fuels. Um, and we don't hear a lot about it because during the daytime, it breaks down really quickly. Um, in warm daylight conditions, it decomposes, and we end up, instead of N2O5, we end up with these gases called NOx or nitrogen oxides. So during the day, when we talk about N2O5, we really care about NOx. And NOx are important because they have negative health impacts, so they can affect um, respiratory and cardiovascular health. Um, NOx are also super important for acid rain. So um, when NOx interact with water, they form nitric acid, and this is a major component of acid rain. Um, many of the early uh, regulations and policies around air quality were focusing on reducing NOx emissions, partially because we needed to control this problem of acid rain. Um, and then finally, NOx are super important because they are very reactive gases, and they can go on in the atmosphere to form ozone and uh, interact with particles, which are also problems uh, for health and air quality. So we care about NOx during the day for all of these health and environmental reasons. But we also care about N2O5 during the evening, because during the evening, N2O5 concentration can build up in the atmosphere, and then it'll interact with particles. And these particles are also super important. So particles have health consequences again for people. Um, the composition and the size of the particles can determine their health impacts, but they can have a range of negative consequences, such as affecting uh, respiratory health and uh, worsening existing respiratory diseases like asthma and COPD. But they can also have really, uh, really damaging effects for like cardiovascular, neurological, or reproductive health and uh, lead to premature mortality. Particles are also important for visibility. Um, so what's really interesting is the National Park Service monitors particles in um, national parks across the U.S. because they want you to have a good time when you go to the national parks. They want you to be able to see the view, right? They don't want you to have this really cloudy, foggy, particle-filled um, experience. Uh, particles are also important for climate change. So different types of particles can have different impacts on climate. Um, where some particles have a warming effect because they absorb incoming solar radiation. Different particles can have a cooling effect because they scatter incoming sunlight. And then still more particles can have um, secondary effects on climate because they act as cloud condensation nuclei and form clouds. And then these clouds can have effects on radiation forcing. And then finally, we care about particles because they have downstream environmental impacts. 
So if particles get deposited into a body of water, for example, they can uh, change the nutrient balance and contribute to things like algal blooms that you can see in this image here. They can also change the pH and composition of soil. So for all these reasons, we really care about particles. But we also care about NOx, and therefore we care about N2O5 and what happens with N2O5 chemistry in the atmosphere. Specifically, I'm really interested in this process of N2O5 interacting with particles and being taken up and contributing to the composition of the particles. So this is the process of N2O5 going from the gas phase and becoming part of the particle phase. We call this uptake. Um, and this uptake predominantly happens in the evening. So I said that N2O5 concentration is really small during the day. It breaks down really quickly. So we really are interested in looking at particle or N2O5 uptake into particles during the evening when it's colder. This process of going from a gas into a particle is uh, represented by this uptake coefficient gamma. Throughout this talk, I will refer to gamma, gamma N2O5, and uptake coefficient synonymously. So whenever I'm talking about those, I'm referring to this gamma value there. Gamma represents a process of so going from your uh, N2O5 as a gas into a particle. When gamma is very big, you have more N2O5 going into the particle phase with the concentration of the gas. All other things being equal, the concentration of the gas will decrease, the concentration of the particle will increase. And this contributes to particle nitrate. Uh, so that has all of the particle consequences that I talked about. Alternatively, if uh, gamma N2O5 is really small, then you have more N2O5 staying in the gas phase, less in the particle phase, and that's when you're really concerned about NOx and those consequences. So it's important to study and understand gamma N2O5 because it has consequences for both gas phase and particle phase uh, health and chemistry. Unfortunately, it's really difficult to directly measure gamma N2O5. This is a process, and so in order to really get an uh, understanding of gamma N2O5 values in ambient conditions out in the field, um, you have to measure a lot of gas concentrations and particle concentrations and then do a box model to get a value of gamma N2O5. It's hard to measure directly. So instead of doing all of that, I work with models to understand this particle uptake process. Um, so this figure is uh, an example of a gamma prediction using the CMAX model or the Community multi scale Air Quality Model. This is the default setting in the, uh, in the CMAX model. So the CMAX model um, can be used to study the regional air quality over the United States. It was originally developed, the model was developed by the EPA, so its predominant focus was looking at the U.S., um, but you can look at other areas of the globe. Um, and the EPA was interested in looking at health and air quality. So a lot of what CMAX focuses on is the simulation of emissions, chemistry, and physics that impact air quality. Um, as I said, the model was developed by EPA, but what's really cool about CMAX is that it is now updated by users. So um, I can go into the code and add a new parameterization, test it out, see how it works, publish the results, and then say, I think that this needs to be updated and incorporated into the next version of the model which is super awesome. So that's actually what my research is on right now. We're implementing a new parameterization of this uptake coefficient and trying to change what this uh, image of gamma N2O5 looks like over the US. Okay, so how do we model gamma N2O5? Um, this is uh, an interesting question and there's been a couple of ways that have been done historically. The way I look at gamma N2O5 is using a resistor framework. So basically each step in going from a gas in moving into the particle can be thought of as a resistance. First, we have gas phase diffusion. Um, so that is the process of the gas floating off somewhere in space and colliding with the particle. If you'd like an analogy, you can think of it as everyone in this room is an N2O5 molecule before you made it into the particle of room 811. You were off somewhere in space as a gas molecule. You had to make your way from your office or from uh, somewhere else on campus or from home and make your way to room 811. And the likelihood that you made it to room 811, to our particle here, depended on things like how far away you were from the space, how quickly you could move here, and the uh, conditions outside, like the temperature. So that's gas phase diffusion. 
The next step is mass accommodation. This can be thought of as like the stickiness factor. So it's how likely it is that once N205 has collided with the particle, will it stick? Um, to continue our analogy, it could be like you made it to room 811, you look around and there are no chairs left and it's not an interesting talk to you, so you decide to turn around and walk away. Alternatively, maybe it's a really interesting talk. It's a very sticky talk and so you decide to come in no matter what. Um, so that's uh, mass accommodation. And then the final step is bulk phase processes. So bulk phase processes are all the things that happen inside the particle to incorporate the N205 molecule into the particle composition. Um, so for our analogy, it would be like you walk into the room, taking your jacket off, taking a chair to sit on, taking out your laptop or a notebook or something like that, and becoming a part of the, the room makeup, the particle makeup. So bulk phase processes are pretty complicated to understand in a model because they depend on the particle composition. What reactions happen with N205 in the particle depends on what's already inside the particle. Um, it can be kind of thought of like how many chairs are already taken up in this room? Do you not want to sit next to someone? And does it have a weird smell in the room? Things like that. Um, so computer models have, uh, it can be kind of difficult to model this step because there's uh, so many different parts of composition that we don't understand and we don't understand how they impact update. Um, one thing we do understand is the difference between an aqueous and an organic particle. Um, so if we have an aqueous particle that promotes uptake of N205, N205 likes an aqueous environment, so it wants to become part of an aqueous particle. On the other hand, an organic particle uh, resists uptake. So N205 doesn't really want to be a part of that organic particle, so it will be left, the resistance um, of the bulk phase will be greater. Um, current models have a hard time, current models don't do a great job of reflecting this complexity. So the, the default setting in the CMAX model looks at only three particle phase species plus water. And that's very limited out of a total of 110 species that are in the particle phase that the model can look at. Um, the geochem model does incorporate a few more species. It has four aqueous phase species, and it includes some organic components, but it's not nearly the totality of components of a particle. So really looking at the composition of the particle is an important way to improve model parameterization. Um, and what I'm interested in looking at is the situation where we have an aqueous core of a particle and an organic coating. So we can break our bulk resistance down into two components now. We have an organic resistance and an aqueous resistance. The organic coating is resisting N205 uptake into the particle, but once N205 makes it through that thin organic coating, it can be incorporated into the aqueous core and it's a happy little molecule. Okay, so. We have our equation, we have our resistances. Now we can plug in our best understanding of the chemistry and physics for each of these resistance steps. And we get this really unfun equation that um, took me a while to understand. I totally need to shout out to Tim Bertram for this because he was super helpful in helping me to understand what was going on and how each of these components impacted the parameterization. So first we have our gas phase diffusion. And like I said, that can depend on things like how fast the particle is moving, how quickly you can make it to room 811. Next, we have our mass accommodation, so that's our stickiness factor. That is just a constant in the model. That is a uh, potential source of error. So the stickiness factor does also depend on like the surface of the particle. We assume that there's a constant value of stickiness for all types of organic coatings. That may or may not be true, but we have one value and we're sticking with it. Did you get my pun? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so lastly, we have our organic and uh, aqueous phase resistant components. I'm realizing the colors are not showing up super well on the screen, I'm sorry. Um, so we can be broken down into three parts. And we have um, sort of this part that asks, how likely it is that our N205 will stay in the organic phase. So it's part of the particle, will it stay in the organic phase or will it decide to go back into the gas phase to fuse away? 
Um, next, we have this question of how likely is it that N2O5 will react in the organic phase or diffuse to the aqueous core? Um, and then finally, we have this component that asks how much N2O5 interacts in the aqueous core. So does it dissociate? Does it react? Does it just sort of float around as an N2O5 molecule? So we have our equation and we plug it into the model. We do a lot of testing and troubleshooting. Um, again, a huge shout out to Monica Perky for helping me with this because that was <coughs> several months of my life that were not fun. Um, and then we can run the model. So we use, other than the community multi-scale air quality model, we run this on a 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer grid over the entire US. We run it in 35 vertical layers. Um, and we ran the model for a time period from January 21st, 2015 to March 16th, 2015. These aligned with field measurements, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but basically we wanted to run during a time period where we knew we had measurements to compare with to validate our data. And our question with running the parameterization was, does the implementation of the new parameterization improve model performance? <coughs> we just wanted to see how different this was from existing parameterizations and they got closer to real world results. So to do that, we looked at field measurements. Um, so as I said, it's hard to make real world measurements of gamma N205 of a process, but you can make a lot of measurements of the gases and the particles that are happening around that process. So we looked at data from the winter 2015 flight campaign this was a flight campaign uh, that took place on the east coast of the United States from February 3rd to March 7th, 2015. It was on board the NCAR C-130. Um, and what's interesting about this campaign is that there were both day and night flights. Oftentimes when you have a flight campaign, you focus on daytime conditions. It's easier to fly a plane during the day. It's easier to see what you're doing, and what could be happening around you, like seeing where five or wildfires, for example. But nighttime conditions are when gamma N205 is really important and when N205 concentrations will be bigger. So we needed to look for data that happened during the night. Um, so in this figure, panel A, we have the 13 research flight tracks that uh, took place during the winter campaign. All of the tracks that are in black are night flights. Um, and then during those nighttime flights, when there was measurements of all of the important chemistry happening, we were able to take that data and run a box model to calculate values of gamma and 205 from those measurements. So for this, I also need to thank Erin McDuffie for sharing her data because she was the one who developed the box model and ran it and got uh, about 3,000 data points worth of gamma and 205 for us to compare with. Um, and then we also wanted to compare our new parameterization with existing model parameterizations. So the CMAP model has uh, five existing parameterizations within the model. This figure shows results from four of those parameterizations. Um, as you can see, there is a lot of variability between the different model parameterizations. The top figure is a set value, which is a huge overestimate. Uh, we now know that, but that for a long time was the default setting in CMAP. Um, the large central figure is the current default, um, and we still think that this is an overestimate of what's happening with gamma and 205. So we wanted to see if we can improve on this central figure. Um, so that is our uh, existing parameterization number one. It's a statistics-based approach from Davis et al. 2008. Um, and it actually only looks at three aqueous particle phase species plus water. Uh, so it's very limited in looking at composition of the particle. And then our second parameterization we compared with um, was a lab-based approach developed by Bertram and Thornton in 2009. And it considers four particle space, phase species plus water, so slightly more complex by one, but still only four out of 110 possible species, which is not a lot. So we ran our model, and we, now we're going to compare our results. Um, so as a reminder, these are the three things that we could look at in the parameterization. We could look at our gas phase N205 concentration. We could look at our gamma N205, so that uptake value, which is the actual thing we changed in the model. Or we could look at particle nitrate concentrations. 
So these are sort of the three direct things that we think might be impacted. There are a lot of secondary things that will be impacted as well, um, such as ozone and NOx, but we will look at those later. These are sort of the first primary steps to see what's changing. So first, let's look at N2O5 gas phase concentration. Uh, so this figure A is the field measurements of gas phase N2O5 concentration taken during the night. Um, so I'd like to point out, it's kind of hard to see, but the uh, color bar scale is a uh, log scale. So it's uh, changing every uh, order of 10. And our N2O5 concentration, they're somewhere in the order of like 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 parts per billion, which is to be expected. There's a small concentration of N2O5, even at night. Our, um, our new method is a little bit lighter yellow color, so we're sort of more in the order of 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2 parts per billion in 205, so we're overestimating slightly compared to field measurements, but it's not too bad. In comparison, the two existing parameterizations during the same time period when nothing else in the model changed are underestimating by a factor of uh, uh, by two or three orders of magnitude, which is a huge difference. Um, one thing I will point out with this is that our field measurements are a very specific set of field measurements. They're from a winter period and they're during the night. These are not normal conditions for most field measurements. Um, and so we kind of expected our results to be better because we knew our parameterization was going to improve something that needed to be improved for nighttime winter conditions. Um, the two existing parameterizations do an okay job when you look at warmer daytime conditions, partially because n 5 concentration is just so small that the difference is not really going to be a big deal. So we do improve n 5 concentration so far. Next, we can look at our values of gamma and 5 So this is that process of going from a gas to a particle as a reminder Small gamma means that you're going to spend most of your time in the gas phase. Large gamma means you're going to spend most of your time in the particle phase. So first we have our new parameterization, um, and this is a histogram plotting the difference between the Cmax values and the winter gamma values. So a small or negative number means that the Cmax model is predicting a smaller value than the field measurements. A positive value means that winter or that CMAC is predicting a larger value than the field measurements. So overall, our new parameterization tends to underestimate gamma N205. And the two existing parameterizations tend to overestimate gamma N205. This totally overlaps with what we saw with uh, in the previous slides with the um, gamma or the N205 gas phase concentrations. So we see that uh, existing parameterizations tend to be positive, meaning they're overestimating Cmax gamma is a little bit larger. So based on our gas phase uh, concentrations and our particle or, and our uh, process variable, the uptake coefficient, we would expect that the new parameterization will have smaller values of particle nitrate and the existing parameterizations will have larger values of particle nitrate. Um, unfortunately, our field measurements don't include particle nitrate values. Um, there is a network of uh, particle speciation monitors across the U.S. We just haven't had the time yet, so this is like pretty new results. We haven't had the time yet to go and compare with the speciation network. So next, we're just going to be looking at the three model outputs of particle nitrate. Um, and so we do see that the new parameterization does tend to have somewhat smaller values of particle nitrate concentration, but the difference is not as big as it was with the gas phase concentration values. Like that was several orders of magnitude. This is like a factor of maybe 1.5 or 2. So we can say, yes, the new parameterization does have lower particle nitrate, which is what we expected, and the existing methods have higher particle nitrate. But we can also say there is definitely some other chemistry happening to change these particle compositions. So this uh, other heterogeneous chemistry that's going on is something that I'm really interested in. 
Um, and so for our next step, one thing I really want to focus on is further developing the model to see what other things are going on in the model. What other parameterizations we can work with to uh, further improve our understanding and prediction of that particle nitrate composition. Um, I'd also like to examine how different variables in the model affect gamma and 205. So like I said, um, things like getting, when you're trying to come into room 811, things like the weather outside impacts your process of coming into this room. Similarly, gamma N205 is affected by things like temperature and relative humidity. So I'd like to correlate those and see how we can um, improve some of the stack functions that we had to implement and make them a little bit more smooth and continuous um, to improve our parameterizations. Uh, we also want to compare model results with other measurements. So like I said, the winter campaign is a very specialized data set. It is looking at a very specific winter, cold, nighttime uh, set of data. And so comparing with measurements of warmer conditions, daytime conditions, and more rural areas that are not as polluted would be interesting to look at. Um, and then finally, sort of my like dream next step would be to refine the model code. So for this process, I had to learn Fortran, but I only learned Fortran enough to like make it work. Um, so it would be really great if I could have, if I could get the chance to make the code a little bit more elegant and streamlined. There had to be a lot of if then or step functions that were implemented um, as part of the parameterization. And it'd be cool if I could figure out more elegant ways of implementing code. Um, and I also would be remiss to add that uh, we're writing this up for a publication. Tracy wanted me to put that in there. So forgot to add it as a bullet point. But yes, that is a big next step as well. Um, so that is all I have for you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I was looking at the chart of the uptake of the mass into the nitrate, I guess it, it seemed like it was preferentially being up Taken up to, or if you go back to the map of the eastern U.S., um, yeah. a little further, uh, this one. Oh, that's so fun. it looked like it's being up taken more, I guess, over the ocean. I assume that it would be organic particles being resistant over land, mid or something like that, and the aqueous particles being more uh, receptive to the uptake. But how do you level that with the? Uh, just the increase of NOx, I guess, being over land in general. At least that's from my understanding. I don't even know if that's true. If there's more NOx because of the human influences over land, and then the so the negative consequences of the uptake as far as nitrates and algae and whatnot. So like, how does that balance? No, that's a super great question. So there's a few things happening. So first, yes, there is a in the Davis parameterization. There's a huge difference between land and water. Um, and part of that is because the Davis parameterization is only looking at three species. And so it's definitely focusing on salts, like things that could happen in two spray aerosol. So that is a definite huge part of it. Um, yeah, so your second sort of question about the polluted air. And uh, so the reason that we, the reason that the winter campaign occurred on the East Coast is that we do have a lot more. Uh, NOx pollution in areas with a lot of high traffic. So like if you think of 95 going all down the East Coast, you're getting a lot of those measurements. Um, and so, yes, there is higher NOx along that corridor. Um, but part of the problem is that the Davis parameterization doesn't really look at that. So it was better suited for looking at things like sulfate. It was not super suited for looking at things like nitrate and NOx. Okay. So this is really like those are great questions and they're realistic questions. They're looking at like what's happening in real life. Davis doesn't look at that super well. Yeah. I have uh, just a clarification question on your equation for gamma. There was a <clears throat> there was a W. That's not is that some. That's some kinematic velocity that temperature dependent, right? It's yeah. Not, it's not a. Yeah. So okay. that is the molecular velocity gas phase in two five is temperature. And so that's where the, the cold part comes into it. Right? That is yeah. So both the diffusion and the um, so we have 
Omega is here right. and here. And so in both of those, that's where the cold comes in. That was, that's where the cold comes in in terms of the uptake. The cold is also important because it hinders the decomposition of N2O5 back into the NO2 and NO3 in the gas phase. Okay. So daytime warm temperatures, N2O5 is more likely to be decomposed. Right. Cold temperatures is more likely or less likely to be decomposed. So that's also part of it. And then I realized you didn't do this part, but so you said that they use <clears throat> the measurements during winter in a constrained box model to get their gamma, but they didn't have any particle phase so N205. So how did they They did have particle phase N205 measurements? We did not get those N205 oh. particle phase N205 measurements. So yeah, great question. I should have clarified. Erin had the particle phase measurements, um, and she included I don't remember off the top of my head. I can go back to the publication, but there were something like 16 gas phase components, and uh, she used the AMS data from the flight. Right. But I don't remember how many particle phase components she looked at. We just never got that data. So we have gamma, N205, N205 concentration, CLNO2 yield, and CLNO2 concentration. And so that was all we could look at. So this, but this was. 2015. I mean, that should be publicly available now, right? Um, I think it's reasonable to request that. Yeah. So we can definitely talk to Aaron, and if I can see if it's right. publicly available. Because yeah. that would really yeah. help. You know, is the model behaving? The model doesn't show right. a big change, but maybe the right. measures do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we actually, so I have also done some preliminary look at looking at the deviation monitors, okay. um, and they show a lot more variability than what was in the model. So we right. do know compared to. Preliminarily, compared to uh, the CCH monitors, there's some other chemistry in the model that needs yeah. to be improved. And then uh, Atlanta sure does stick out. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so our, some of our next steps and areas of, to focus on, uh, Atlanta could definitely be on the top of the list. One thing that we have put in the EPA proposal was to look at Phoenix, Arizona, and St. Louis, Missouri, as interesting areas as well. So there's a couple of cities that we'd like to zoom in on. But yeah, Atlanta is standing out as different. <laughs> yeah. At Youngstown, Ohio, too, on the border of Pennsylvania, that's a big rubber yeah. plant, you know, area. Yeah. Is that also a little bit? It could be. I mean, there's a lot going on here. And part of the problem is that we can only look at gamma and 205 values in limited places during this flight campaign. There's only, it's like 2,800 uh, measurements that Aaron was able to calculate, or uh, box model results Aaron was able to calculate. So, like, we could have had data along this entire flight track, but we don't. We only have it over Atlanta because of limited results or measurements. So, I mean, there could be things happening here that we're not seeing. So. There is a question online from Kari. She says, great talk. I was wondering, can we use this data to observe the vertical distribution? Is there any advantage in looking to the vertical distribution? And if so, is there any big difference between day and night? Yeah, okay, so those are great questions. Um, we did run the model with 35 vertical layers, so it does get a full vertical distribution of what's happening in the stratosphere. Um, and the flight results, so it's a flight campaign to go up and down in altitude, so we do have difference in altitude. Um, and that's what's happening here in each of these, so this is matching with altitude. Um, I haven't yet looked at the vertical distribution of the flight results, so it would be cool to get a, a profile with altitude. That would be awesome. So, yeah, that is something to look at. Yeah, Evan. How common are the, the particle types for the kind of looking at the objects or the organics? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so, we're realizing as instrumentation becomes better and better and more able to to measure many different components of particles, we're realizing that complex particles are a lot more common. Like early models definitely were thinking of things like you have a soot or you have a dust or you have like a salt. Um, and we're getting much more complicated and realizing that yes, there are organic and aqueous particle or uh, like mixed particles um, and that phase separation can happen. So yeah. And yeah. also a related question would be like, if there's microbial light, in the particles, does that change what's going on? That's super interesting. And yeah, so there is uh, some research into like how um, uh, like soil and leaf litter can get bacteria into particles. So I have no idea, but that's a super interesting question. And I, I 
would like to read a little bit more about that. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ian. So the um, distribution is uh, again mass, so the central uh, five particles uh, vary drastically between the two uh, uh, Oh, yeah. So we haven't looked at that, but that's another really good question. Um, so Ian was talking about if you have particles that are like more aqueous versus more organic or all organic or all aqueous how does the distrib how much uh n205 ends up in each of those types of particles um, and that's a super great question because that would totally depend on our version of this n205 parameterization we think we have less uh n205 in the particle if it was totally organic but we have more if it was aqueous so that's something we definitely need to confirm so yeah great question yeah Kind of related, and I might have said this when I was connected, but for the other existing uh, sort of foundations, did they, uh, are they using the same like organic? No, yeah. So the existing parameterization, the default one in CMAC. Um, so this might be a helpful slide. So this is the, the, the big picture is the existing default setting in CMAC. Um, it was based off of. Uh, I want to say seven lab studies that just looked at how temperature, relative humidity, um, NO3 concentration, SO4 concentration, and ammonia concentration affected uh, uptake. So they didn't consider organics at all. They were all lab-derived particles, and so they would just like take solutions with salt in them and then vaporize them until they became particle phase in you know the air, and then like added in some NO5 and measured how NO5 concentration changed. And, so it's very simple, and the parameterization is just statistics based. So it's like we have all of these measurements from labs. Let's plot a best fit line for each of these situations, and then make a parameterization. Yeah, um, the other parameterization, the Bertram and Thornton one, that was based on just one lab study, um, and they looked at instead of just three, they looked at four components, but still nothing organic. So yeah, both of these are missing the organic phase. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Oh, yeah. Nitrogen deposition. So, yeah, that's another really interesting question. Um, so, nitrogen deposition would not, it's not a primary interest of ours. It's definitely uh, environmental, it has environmental impacts, um, and it is of interest in air quality. Um, it's not our primary interest, though, because we are trying to figure out what's happening to the chemistry while the particle is still in the air. So the CMAC model can measure, there's a, a deposition rate, but it's like a constant, it's not a constant, it's based on another parameterization, but we are not impacting that parameterization. So it's not really something that we could look at in the model. We're not varying it, we're not changing it. Um, but it is an interesting question for environmental and air quality questions yeah yeah terry yeah i got kind of a weird question um hopefully it's not too intricate but i was wondering how the model get the, the species um and assimilate do they use like ground observations or yeah like, yeah <laughs> does it kind of blow it around or so that's a uh slightly complicated question so when we start the model um we have these input files and one of the input files is the uh national emissions inventory the nei um and so those are uh shared for certain years to the epa and so we have like a 2016 nei and use that to try to run your model for 2016 and it's basically what chemistry the epa knows is being emitted and then you also have your input conditions, your boundary conditions that you put into the model, and then it just says, okay, good, so we know this much chemistry should be happening or should be starting these conditions. So once you put in all of your input conditions for the model, you just let it run with the chemistry that's there. So we're not really, we're not using, um, like, we're not assimilating measurements every time step. We have one set of measurements of uh, observations, measurements that the EPA provides to the NEI, and that's kind of, and then we also have the uh, smoke, which is this. Uh, Sparse matrix. Offers, yeah, something. 
kernel of emissions, which is sort of how the NEI gets incorporated into the, um, the CMAP model. Um, yeah, so it's not, there's not that sort of data assimilation stuff that incorporates all these measurements from different monitors around the semester. So it's, they kind of initiate the monitor. Yeah, yeah. So each of the concentrations is calculated in a time step, and then it's saved to that like grid file. And then you use that grid file from the previous time step to run the next time step, and then you save it to the grid file. So yeah. Yeah, I would I would definitely start like before you start getting the vertical part, I yeah. would definitely start to like look at your your uh, some of your flight tracks and kind of see how the model does for the vertical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So could it be um there's a question about what that position. Could it be that the reason you don't see a difference in the model, even though you're clearly something a lot more in there, is it just preferentially draining out? That actually, yeah, when you said that, that is an interesting thought. And I don't know, it could be happening. Um, one of our next steps is to look at the one of an, another parameterization of some more heterogeneous chemistry in the particle, which is the CLNO2 yield. And so if that also doesn't really change particle nitrate, if we do implement this new parameterization, we don't see a difference, it could be possible that deposition is part of it. And that might be more evidence to look at that that wet deposition. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's something I have to think about more. Yeah. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you all.